Welcome to Westbridge this morning. We are so glad you are with us. Please worship with us this morning. The words will be up on the board if you need them.
continue to lean into that this morning, Jesus. You fight our battles before us. You surround us. You go before us. We're so thankful for you this morning.
reminder this morning through these lyrics that we're singing that you are a God who is with us. You care about what we're going through, Jesus. You are close to the broken heart and you fight our battles for us. And all you ask is that we follow you, that we come to know you and that we follow you, Jesus. That we learn to love people the way you did. Lift this community up this morning, Jesus, and ask that we would just draw into deeper relationship with you. Would you make us more like you, Jesus? It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. You can go ahead, have a seat, and get ready to enjoy the rest of the service. Welcome everyone to Westbridge, whether you are online or in person. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Eli and I'm one of the pastors here. If you're a first time guest with us today, welcome. We're so glad you're here. If you wanna learn more about Westbridge, download the Westbridge app. We've got a button called five and five on the app where you can learn five things in five minutes or less about Westbridge. On your way in this morning, you might've taken a program and inside you'll find three things. First is an outline to follow along with today's talk. Next is a connection card. If you're a first time guest, feel free to fill out as much information as you feel comfortable giving us. If you bring that card to the lobby to the next steps area, we have a t-shirt for you. It's just our way of saying thank you for being here today. The last thing in the program is a giving envelope. If you'd like to give today, you can drop it off at any giving station on the way out of the auditorium. You can also drop it in the mail anytime this week, postage is already paid. You can also give by text, just text any dollar amount to 84321 to get started. We wanted to take a moment to celebrate worship night and the baptisms from last Sunday. It was an incredible evening of worship and communion and 30 people celebrated their faith and their hope through in Jesus through water baptism. Our next water baptism will be in March at our next worship night, if that's the right next step for you. As we move to the next part of the service, we want to let you know that Westbridge is intentional at creating welcoming environments online or in person for everyone. So no matter what your relationship with God is or isn't, we're glad you're here. Enjoy the rest of the service. Good morning. Welcome to Westbridge Church. My name is Jeremiah. I'm one of the pastors here. Great to have you with us today. I want to say hello to everybody joining us online. Thanks for participating there. And if you're in a parent viewing room, great option if you have small kids you prefer to keep with you during the service. Uh, real quick before we jump into this new talk, new series today, uh, in the chair in front of you, in the pocket in front of you, there is a little card, and that is a thank you to our kids' volunteer leaders. And so uh, you can either scan the QR code on that card or uh, at some point during the service, grab that card. And if you have kids that are back there uh, in, during the, any of the services, would you just write a thank you to your kids, uh, leaders? Uh, every week, we've got uh, several different areas, uh, you know, at, ranging from nursery to two, we have a two-year-old room, a three-year-old room, a four and five-year-old room, a kindergarten room, a first grade room. And we divide by those ages because there's so many kids. And that means that we have people who are in the nursery every single week times three services. In the first grade room every single week times three services. Fourth and fifth grade every single week times three services. And so there's just an army of volunteers who just uh, give their time a couple times a month to be back there teaching kids and showing them what it looks like to follow Jesus. And so uh, we just want to let them know how much we appreciate them. And so if you would just take a minute anytime, uh, just jot down some thoughts, uh, say a quick thank you. We want to get these cards back to them so that they can read the difference and the impact that they're making. And then at the end of service, just drop them into the giving stations on your way out. Or if you prefer to do it digitally, there's a QR code, scan that, type in a comment, let them know how much they mean to us. And we want all of our kids volunteers to know what an amazing job they're doing and how much they mean to us. And it's fitting that we do this today because uh, we're talking about this uh, vision of where we're going for the future. And we've got kids who are in the back who are, uh, I was sharing this with somebody today, uh, you know, my, my youngest is 10. And so that means in 10 years, I'm going to have a 20-year-old. Uh, and uh, they're going to be, they're going to be the ones really running this church. It's going to be like a lot of the kids that are in fourth and fifth grade and sixth and seventh grade. And, uh, you know, you, you fast forward into the future and they are the future of our church. And so uh, we want to do such an amazing job of planting those seeds early when they're the, back there. So thanks for doing that. Uh, 
This is uh, an exciting series for us. Uh, back in the day, uh, there, there is a race that takes place every year in Alaska called the Iditarod. If you've ever heard of this, it's a thousand mile dog sled race. And people come from all over the place to participate in it, to watch it. Uh, it's this big spectacle. But it didn't start off as a race. The Iditarod actually began as a rescue mission. There was a <clears throat> community uh, called Nome, Alaska. <coughs> Excuse me. It had about 1,400 people. And at one point, there was an outbreak of diphtheria. And it, it was really causing uh, quite a, a lot of illness in the community. There was one doctor in that community, Dr. Curtis Welch, and he had actually called for the antitoxin serum so that he could administer it to people. But uh, because of the weather, the, the ocean and so much ice in the ocean, they couldn't ship it. Uh, because of the weather, they couldn't fly it in. And so this little community was isolated. Four people had died already, and it was beginning to spread. And so he, he sends a telegraph, and the nearest uh, sort of provision of the antitoxy serum is in Anchorage, Alaska. It's about a thousand miles away. And so they get together a group of 20 mushers and about 150 sled dogs, and they make the trek. They load up a bunch of the antitoxin serum, and they put it onto their sleds, and they make the trek, and they do it in five and a half days. And they deliver the antitoxin serum to this community. And at the end of it, uh, as they sort of administer the, the medicine, they only ended up losing about 10 people in all in the midst of this, uh, in the midst of this sort of mini pandemic that's taking place in this community. It's an amazing story. Well, fast forward about 50 years, and they decide we're going to create a race to commemorate this. And then you have people signing up for it. And going, we're going to make that run, and you have families going, and it's this uh, sort of event that was created to commemorate the mission. It was created as an event for people to gather together with family and friends, and it becomes this really big spectacle. And starting an event to commemorate an incredible rescue mission is obviously a great thing. But, but here's a more valuable lesson I don't want us to miss. Something that starts off with great purpose and a specific mission can eventually turn into a spectator sport. Something that starts off as a mission eventually becomes a spectator sport. It can happen in industries. It can happen in business. It can happen in any movement. And it can happen in our lives. And it can happen in churches as well. And so today we're launching a three-week series. And to be very candid with you, this series is really designed for those of you who would consider Westbridge Church your church home. And I say that because I'm going to speak very, very candidly as your pastor. I'm going to talk a lot about our mission. I'm going to talk about who we are where we're headed, the impact that we want to make, and how we're going to get there. And so if you're new to Westbridge, I'm thrilled that you're here. Uh, this is a great way for you to kind of lift up the hood, kind of peel, peel back the curtain, see who we are. Uh, but I'm so glad that you're here because you get to learn who we are at our core. And, and if you're a guest, if, I'm thrilled you're here. Regardless of what you think about Jesus or what you think about churches, my hope is to inspire you and help you to have a greater understanding of the impact that a local church can make. Now, Every church, every church starts off with a very clear sense of mission. And regardless of which words you use, really every church has the same mission because we didn't come up with it ourselves. It was given to us by Jesus. And the mission is this, people helping people find and follow Jesus. That's the mission of Westbridge Church. It's the mission of every church uh, because it's rooted in some of the last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples before he left this earth. And here's what Jesus would say to them. He says, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He says, go and make disciples. Teach them to, to follow my ways. Help people find me and show them what it looks like to follow me. He tells his followers, I'm giving you this responsibility to engage with people, to relate to people, to connect to people, to serve people in such a way that it points them to me. And that's the mission. It's handed off to his disciples and the first generation of Jesus followers. And then they handed off the mission to the next generation who handed it off to the next generation. Fast forward to today. And we are the stewards of the mission. We are the stewards of the mission that Jesus gave his disciples for our generation and for the next generation. And so it's our responsibility to help people find and follow Jesus. And every time a new church gets started, it's, it's obvious they're driven by this mission. There's a sense of urgency. 
Anytime a brand new church starts and when people come together to start a church, they obsess over finding ways to convey the hope and the love and the kindness and the compassion that would point people to Jesus. But over time, over time, for any organization, for any business, for any company, and for any church, over time, churches, as we get more established, Facilities are built and systems are put in place and and friendships are formed and budgets are determined and the leadership team grows. And as people come and go, what often happens is that these churches that once had a very clear mission and everybody was excited about and many of them participated in, eventually it can turn into a spectator sport. And if we're not careful, the mission drifts from people helping people find and follow Jesus to a group of people who gather together to commemorate the mission rather than to participate in the mission. And so that's why this series is so critical and so important in the life of our church. We must never lose sight of the mission. We did not get started to simply host events or provide great music or to create a safe place to network with people. Uh, We we don't uh, get started. We didn't start this church simply to teach, you know, good values to kids or to provide some faith-based TED Talks. That's not the mission. That's not the goal. And if you're not familiar with our church's history, we started in 2006. Uh, my, myself and my wife and 10 other adults in a living room and just said, hey, we think that church could look like this. What do you think? Huh? And people were like, let's do it. And we didn't anticipate that. And so we went, okay, our first service is a week from Sunday. Let's go. And, well, where should we go? Like, where are we going to hold service? And I said, I don't know. Invite your friends. When I have a spot, I'll tell you where to send them. And that was it, man. We had no money. We had no staff. We had nothing. I had no idea uh, what God wanted to do. We just said, okay, we think, we think God's in this. And as you sort of look through the years, through the history, we went from our living room to a community center. We met in there once a month, and then we moved into the movie theater when they opened, and we met in there. We added a second service, and after a year, we added a second service, and then moved out of there and moved into Big Woods Elementary School, and we're setting up, and we're tearing down, and I was talking to somebody yesterday, and we were kind of reminiscing about these years of setup and tear down. He's like, I remember this one day, he, was, he would drive trucks and trailers for us, and he's like, it was stuck, and it, you know, it was stuck in the rain, and it's the, the whole trailer had sunk down in because of the, because of the rain, and so I, I took the church truck and then I attached my truck to the front of the church truck and another volunteer attached his truck to the front of my truck and we used three trucks to just pull that thing out of there. 5.30 in the morning on a Sunday, you know, it's freezing cold and everything's like sinking down and because of the rain, he's just like, but man, we just, there was a lot of energy around those days. And it's, it's amazing to think back. We went from Big Woods Elementary to Middle School East to Middle School West. <laughs> For a while, it was like, hey, come as you are, as long as you can find us. <laughs> we might be meeting here this week. We might be meeting there this week. And our church has an exciting journey. It's included the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. And through it all, God has been faithful. And we are an 18-year-old church. And we're thriving. And and we have a lot to celebrate. And at the same time, we've got to be very, very careful to guard ourselves from becoming spectators who gather together to commemorate an event. And we must regularly remind ourselves everything we do. Weekly services, children and student programming, local and global outreach, our music, our teaching, our facilities, our events, all of it is intended to help people find and follow Jesus. Everything we do is intended to help point people to Jesus. We're kind of like this person right here. You've seen these people out on the street corner, right? And these people always look like they've just taken a bunch of edibles. Because either they're super jacked up or they're just like, what's up, man? It's amazing, uh, these people who hold this sign, they, they, they do it in all types of weather, and the whole goal is to, to point somewhere, right? It's to point you to a new restaurant, it's to point you to an, a new store that's opening, it's to point you to some kind of big sale, and guess what? That's what the church does. This is what we do. With our lives, with the way that we conduct ourselves, with the way that we live, with the way that we speak, with the way that we give, with the way that we serve, here's what we're doing. We're holding the big arrow, pointing to Jesus. That's the mission of the church, that in all types of weather, in all types of environments, we're using our words, we're using our actions to love and to point people to the hope that they can find in Jesus. But here's the reality. The longer that we do this, uh, the more redundant it can feel. And that's why uh, some sign holders get very creative, don't they? 
<clears throat> you've seen them out there and they're just like flipping it around like crazy and they're break dancing. And, uh, it's like anything I can do to, to just like uh, keep this thing spinning around and keep myself entertained. A lot like this guy right here. Pretty amazing, right? What a sign spinner. Now, here's the only problem. We don't know what direction he's pointing or what the sign even says. But it's impressive. And if we're not careful, churches can do the exact same thing. Uh, we, we do giveaways and events and we find talented musicians and speakers and none of this is wrong. But if we're not careful, our sign can point in the wrong direction. Pretty soon, uh, our, our sign can point to some political candidate that we put our hope in. Pretty soon, our, our sign, our arrow can point to things that we're all against. Let's just be against things. Pretty soon, our arrow will point us uh, as a church It'll point to just ourselves. Hey, look at us. Look at how talented we are. Look at how creative we are. Look at how amazing we are. And instead of pointing to Jesus, it points to us. That's why through the years, we're always careful when we talk about Westbridge, when we promote Westbridge, the goal is not that Westbridge gets the credit. Someday, this church will look different. It might have a different name. Like, who cares? Westbridge is just a holding place on the internet. It's a way to point people to a facility. But at the end of the day, we've always had this prayer that when people leave Westbridge Church, they're not impressed with Westbridge Church. That we would point them to Jesus. That when people leave Westbridge Church, they would go, man, I didn't realize the hope that is found in Jesus. That's the mission. That's the goal. That we want to point people. And this shift from pointing in the direction of Jesus to pointing in every other direction and getting all kind of caught up in different things, it's, it's subtle, but it's very real. I want us, in fact, to look at a very real-life example of this from about 2,700 years ago. Uh, we see this happen in the life of King Hezekiah. This is King Hezekiah. This is actually a, a hieroglyph that was found on a cave in the middle. And no, I'm just kidding. Someone drew that. Uh, Hezekiah became the king of Judah when he was 25 years old. And at the time, the nation was in the midst of political and financial and spiritual mess. And the first thing that he did was establish worship practices to point people back to the goodness and the faithfulness of God. In fact, we have a, a sort of a summary of his reign that we find in one of the books of history in the Hebrew Scriptures. It says this, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before or after his time. He remained faithful to the Lord in everything, and he carefully obeyed all the commands the Lord had given Moses. So the Lord was with him, and Hezekiah was successful in everything he did. He was a godly man. He's a courageous leader. During his reign, uh, Judah was never conquered by any other nations. Judah experienced economic growth. They did a lot of construction. One of his biggest engineering feats was this underground aqueduct that brought water into Jerusalem. It's called Hezekiah's Tunnel. It still exists today. Uh, it, Hezekiah was incredibly wealthy from what he had inherited from other kings. And then he added to that wealth with the things he accumulated during his lifetime. He was loved by almost everyone. He's living the good life. And then around 40 years old, he is hit with a life-threatening illness and confined to his bed. And while he's lying in bed, a, a Jewish prophet by the name of Isaiah shows up to visit him. The prophet shows up. And, and guess what? Uh, Isaiah shows up, and you know what he doesn't do? He, he doesn't uh, show up to, with, to the hospital room with something that he got from the gift uh, store in the lobby, right? Uh, he, he's not carrying balloons or a teddy bear. He isn't sneaking in ice cream. Isaiah shows up instead with a prophecy, with a message from God, and he tells Hezekiah, all right, Hezekiah, listen, you got to get your affairs in order. You're not going to survive this. In the next few days, this illness is going to take you. Now, how would you respond to a message like that? To know, like, okay, you just have a few days to live. I think I'd start making calls to my friends and family, right? Maybe start a GoFundMe. I would update my will uh, based on how my kids were treating me in that particular moment in time. Uh, the very first thing Hezekiah does is he prays. He begs God to have mercy and extend healing. Now, I just want us to think about this for a second. There's a lot of theological discussion and debate around the topic of whether or not God can change his mind. There, there's debate over the impact of prayer. But here's an example of someone who calls out to God in prayer, and God hears his prayer, listens, and responds. It, it felt like his destiny was seemingly determined. And the reason that should matter to us and the reason that should inspire us is because there are a lot of people who have written books or opinion pieces about the inevitable demise of the church in America. But the church is going downhill. Plenty of studies that say that the best days of the church in America are behind us. 
But I am telling you, I have not given up hope. I wholeheartedly believe that if we as individuals and collectively as a church, if we will call out to God and if we will pray and do our best to align ourselves with his heart and his mission, it's possible that in his mercy, he will supernaturally renew us as individuals and as a church. It's possible that in his grace, he would allow Westbridge Church to be a part of a spiritual awakening in our area. And so even though Hezekiah was essentially on his deathbed, he prays. And God responds to his prayer. And before Isaiah has even left the parking lot, God speaks to Isaiah and he says, go back and tell, tell Hezekiah, uh, go, go back. He's just giving him the bad news and God speaks to him and says, go back to Hezekiah and give him these two messages. One, God is going to heal you. He's going to add 15 more years to your life. Two, God is going to protect you from the threatening Assyrian army. They're not going to conquer you. And then Isaiah makes it clear, God's going to do this, not simply because of his prayers, And for Hezekiah's sake, God actually says this, I'm going to do it for my own honor and for the sake of my servant David. You go, why in the world would God do this for the sake of his servant David? That doesn't even make sense. Hezekiah is a descendant of King David. He's 13 generations removed from King David. So it doesn't even make sense. Why would he do this? In fact, here's King David, and then you have all of these other kings, and at the very end, 13 generations later, you have Hezekiah. Why would God say, okay, Hezekiah, I'm going to heal you for the sake of my servant David? Why would God do that? God says, based on your ancestor David, based on the prayers that he prayed, the promises I made to him, I'm going to show you mercy. And I think one of the most important lessons that we can learn as followers of Jesus is this. We are just one small piece of the puzzle that God has been assembling throughout history and across generations. We are a part of something that is so much bigger than ourselves. This isn't just about us, just in this moment in time. We are a link in the chain. We are a part of this massive puzzle. And it's critical to understand. Because right now, our church is in an exciting season. There's no doubt about it. Over the past two years, we've doubled in attendance. We've grown 51% in the last 24 months. That's crazy. We've had a record number of individuals surrender their lives to following Jesus. Getting baptized in water. Over 1,500 people have started following Jesus, said, yes, I want to begin a a relationship with God since we started Westbridge Church 18 years ago. Over 1,500 people have checked that box and prayed a prayer and said, I want to say yes to Jesus. We've baptized over 1,000 people since we started this church. In fact, last week we, we celebrated this. 30 people were baptized last week. That brings that to 110 people that we've baptized just in 2024 alone. We're experiencing momentum right now. If we wanted to, we could take credit for that because we're the ones who are here and we're working and we're volunteering and we're giving and we're praying. But I'm convinced what we are experiencing as a church is in large part a result of the prayers that were prayed by those who asked God to bring a church like this into this area before it ever existed. Those who lived here, those who had family members who were far from God and said, God, please send a church. Please send people. Please, God, do something in our area. And people would pray and ask God. And we're just the, the, the answer to so many prayers that were prayed. It's the result of a small group of people in a living room 18 years ago who dreamed of a life-giving church in this community. It's the result of people who set up and tore down in community centers and movie theaters and schools on a weekly basis for 13 years. Uh, If you've never been a part of a church that has to set up and tear down every week, uh, I'm genuinely, I mean this, it's really fun. It it really is. For six months. And after six months, it's really exhausting. And there's a group of people in those early days of this church who did that week in and week out, month in, month out, year in, year out, for 13 years, loading in trucks and trailers, setting up, turning a school into a church, holding services, and then tearing it all back down and turning it back into a school. And it's amazing. What we're experiencing now is the compounded interest. It's the compounded impact of 18 years of individuals linking arms and sacrificing to help people find and follow Jesus. So let's get back to the story. God healed King Hezekiah, gave him another 15 years of life. We don't know the details. It just says after he was healed, he started to think there was something pretty special about him. He started to feel a little bit entitled. Uh, The scriptures tell us pride started to take hold of his heart. He began to think, well, I deserve God's goodness and God's blessing. I I must be something pretty special. Not long after he's healed, the king of Babylon sent representatives from Babylon. 
They brought a gift basket and some cards and congratulating King Hezekiah for getting better. And when the envoys from Babylon showed up, here's what we read. Hezekiah received the Babylonian envoys and showed them everything in his treasure houses. The silver, the gold, the spices, and the aromatic oils. He also took them to see his armory and showed them everything in his royal treasuries. There was nothing in his palace or kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. So he's just walking around going, oh, check this out. Look what we've accumulated here. Look what I got over here. There's, I don't, I'm, I'm going to show you guys everything. And he's kind of just like on this flex tour. And Hezekiah's pride is starting to surface. And everything, even though everything he has is the result of God's blessing and God's faithfulness and God's goodness, he's starting to become the center of his own story. The arrow is starting to point away from God and towards himself. And Hezekiah walks these envoys around, and here's what he does not say. He doesn't say, let me show you some of the ways that God has blessed us as a nation because we've followed his ways and we've been faithful to him. Let me show you how God has personally given me more than I ever deserve. Uh, let, me, let me tell you about how I was on the verge of death and God answered my prayer. And not just my prayer, but the prayers that were prayed 13 years ago, 13, or 13 generations ago by my ancestor David. And I've never been more impressed with God. I've never been more in awe of God. And when you walk around and you see all of this, man, it has nothing to do with me. That's what he should have said. But he doesn't say that. Even though he loves God, his pride's gotten in the way. The arrow is pointing in the wrong direction. It's pointing towards himself. And don't miss this. It is possible for us to love God and still have the arrow pointing in the wrong direction. It's possible for us to genuinely love God and then feel entitled and then begin to point the arrow towards ourselves and then begin to point the arrow towards our church and towards our accomplishments and towards our history. It's, it's so possible for us to genuinely love God but feel entitled and, and pride to begin to take root in our hearts where we take credit for the gifts and the passions and the talents and the resources that God has blessed us with. So Hezekiah is giddy. He tells Isaiah, man, you should have seen their reaction. I showed them all this stuff. I mean, they were blown away. They were so envious of me. They couldn't believe everything I had. They couldn't believe the wealth that we've accumulated as a nation. And then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, listen to this message from the Lord. The time is coming when everything in your palace, all the treasures <clears throat> stored up by your ancestors until now will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. This is the precursor to Daniel, which we've been in a series the last few weeks. Some of your very own sons will be taken away into exile. They will become eunuchs who will serve in the palace of Babylon's king. Everything that you've shown them they're going to come and take because of your pride. And Isaiah says, you took credit for something that you should have never taken credit for. And instead of pointing to the goodness and the faithfulness of God, you acted like it was your doing. And as a result, the time is coming when the Babylonian armies are going to take it all. Now, here's why I tell you this story. And here's what's so absolutely fascinating about this. Listen to Hezekiah's response when he, when he hears the, the prophecy from Isaiah that says, Babylon's going to come and carry all this stuff away. Here's his reaction. Hezekiah said to Isaiah, this message you have given me from the Lord is good. I'm sorry, what? Perhaps you didn't hear me, Hezekiah. Like, I don't, I don't know if you understand here. Why would that be good? There, there, there will come a time where the same guests that you entertained, the ones that you just showed all the glitz and the glamour to, they're going to march back into the city. They're going to carry off even some of your own sons. And, and they're going to destroy the temple. They're going to ransack the gold and the silver. And Hezekiah's response is, the message you've given me from the Lord is good. What is he thinking? Now, rarely in scriptures are we given insight or a glimpse into someone's internal monologue. But in this particular instance, it actually gives us insight into why Hezekiah responded the way that he responded. He says... This message you have given me from the Lord is good, for the king was thinking, at least there will be peace and security during my lifetime. I don't care if my actions impact the next generation. I don't care if my, my pride has impacted the next generation in a negative way. At least it won't happen in my lifetime. At least I will have peace and safety. At least I will be comfortable. Hezekiah loved God, but his pride his entitlement, the blessing, it started to derail his life and his legacy. And we should all understand this because life is filled with examples of what happens when 
pride and comfort get in the way. And marriages get derailed and finances get out of control and friendships are destroyed. And we've seen this happen in churches also. And here's why. The biggest threat to our mission is our personal comfort. That we get comfortable. That we start to think, well, as long as, as, long as the church works for me, as long as it works in my lifetime, as long as it's good for me, I don't have to worry about how it impacts the next generation. We're in a season of our church where life is comfortable. Like, we could stay right where we're at, and this would be a great church. And I'm honored that I get to even be a part of it. I mean, it would be so easy for me to just spend the next 25 years just being comfortable. Let's just focus on good music and good messages and great life groups and helping people connect and serving our community. And I could do that and I wouldn't feel much pressure. Everybody would be happy because uh, we wouldn't be asking anybody to do anything. But in every season, in every generation, churches must confront their comfort for the sake of the mission. And like Hezekiah, we could choose to focus on our own lifetime. Hey, as long as I'm fine, as long as everything goes well in my lifetime, why do I need to worry about the next generation? Uh, if there is comfort in my lifetime and if the church works for me, then that's all that matters. But Jesus would say something very, very different than that. This is what Jesus would say. If a man is a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hills and go out to search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than over the 99 that didn't wander away. In the same way, it is not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. For Jesus, the mission is not about our comfort. It has, has been and always will be about helping the one who was lost. So much so that he would leave the 99 who are found to pursue the one who is lost. And when we say that word lost, setting aside our own pride and comfort, this is exactly what God did for you and me. At one point in our lives, we were lost. Now that doesn't mean like a, a GPS coordinate, right, on a map. It means, lost means disconnected from our Heavenly Father. And Jesus, wasn't, Jesus wanted his followers to know the mission isn't about our comfort. That the number one priority of Jesus was to seek and save those who are lost, those who are disconnected from God. That is what makes the heart of God beat fast. And so this season is an opportunity for us to confront our comfort. This season is an opportunity for us to create more space for more people to find and follow Jesus. That we would be not concerned about the 99 that are in safety and comfort, that we would be concerned about the one that is lost that we would be a church that constantly has our eyes searching the horizon for the one. This season is an opportunity to join Jesus in his mission for the one. It's an opportunity to create more space so the message of Jesus goes beyond our lifetime and makes an impact in the next generations. And that's why we're kicking off this series. That's why we're kicking off this campaign. This is a generosity initiative because we need to raise money to double our capacity so that we can bring the message of the hope of Jesus to more people. That's just the reality. And specifically, we are the stewards of the faith of the next generation. But where will our younger kids and teenagers and families hear about the hope of Jesus if we run out of room for them? We must confront our comfort and work to create spaces for the one that is far from God. You know what I love? Just a few weeks ago, we had a bunch of teenagers on a weekend retreat. And the speaker at that retreat was a youth pastor, He's got four kids of his own, came and spoke the whole weekend to all of our teenagers. And what our teenagers got to experience was that that speaker was a teenager in my youth group when I was a youth pastor. That's the impact, generation after generation. And now he's leading, and he's got his four kids, him and his wife have four kids, and he's leading in a church, and he's a youth pastor at a church, and it's amazing to see the impact now in the next generation, in the next generation, in the next generation. That's what we got to do. And so For the One, I want to be very clear, very candid. And For the One is a three-year generosity campaign so that we can raise money to add on to this facility. So this is what I'm going to ask you to do. On your way out today, we've got a booklet for you. It's going to show you floor plans. It's going to show you renderings. It's going to show you the goal, the mission. So I'm going to ask you to do something just over the next few minutes. On your way out, we have enough of these, one for every family. And we're going to give this and put this in your hands. And I just want you to take this home with you. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do today. I, I, I don't want you to freak out. We're going to throw a lot of stuff at you. It's going to be drinking from a fire hose in the next five minutes. So hang in here with me. First, I'm going to ask you to pray. Would you just pray? Like, 
would you commit to praying that God would provide all that we need so that we can begin construction on expanding this facility? I can't wait until the day when this room that we're in right now is just filled with kids. That's gonna be awesome. Would you pray for wisdom? Would you pray for favor with the city? Would you specifically pray for the one in your own life? Like, is there somebody in your sphere of influence? Is there a neighbor? Is there a family member? Is there a loved one, a coworker, a friend? that you go, man, they really need to experience the hope that I have found in Jesus. Would you start to pray for that person? Would you start to pray that God would give you an opportunity to impact them, that they would come to find and follow Jesus? And then secondly, would you learn? Just come and learn. This is what I'm asking you to do. Over the next two weeks, we're gonna host 10 different Q&A meetings here at church. So you'll have the opportunity to pick a time slot that works for you, and we'll provide childcare. You come, we're gonna do 10 one-hour Q&A sessions. We're gonna open up everything fully transparent. All right, here's what this looks like. Here's what it's gonna cost. Here's who we're working with. Uh, here's all the details. We'll answer as many questions as we can. But would you come and learn? And don't freak out. Just come back to a meeting. Ask your questions. We're gonna be hosting a ton of those over the next few weeks. And all I'm asking you to do is go into the app or go to westbridgechurch.com forward slash for the one. And we've created a whole page there and come back and learn and ask your questions. And, and this is where you're gonna sign up. You're gonna either go into the app or you're gonna go into uh, westbridgechurch.com forward slash for the one and sign up for one of these Q&A sessions. Because we just wanna walk through it together as a church family. And come and learn, ask your questions, hear the stories of those whose lives have been changed because of Westbridge Church. And then, number three, pledge. This is in a couple of weeks. When you've gotten all your questions answered, here's what we need to do as a church. We're going to make commitments. So two weeks from today, on November 24th, we're going to receive pledges. And that means we're going to do our best to make a commitment to what we think we could do above and beyond our regular giving over the next three years to see this expansion happen. And this is why attending a Q&A meeting is so important because it gives all of us an opportunity to go through all the details in person. And then, number four, would you give? Would you make a commitment and then keep that commitment? Pray, pray for our church, pray for our community, pray for your friends. Learn all that you can about this initiative. Make a pledge of what you could do above and beyond for the next three years and then give according to what God has given to you. Now, because you're gonna get this booklet, and because I don't want you to freak out, there's some big numbers in there. We currently owe $3 million on this facility. But here's why that's so healthy. This facility is worth somewhere between seven and $8 million, and we owe three. So we're really healthy. We've worked really hard as a leadership team to always budget with margin so that there's always margin, that we never feel crunched. I never want to talk about generosity from a place of need. So we just always go, hey, you're just, you've been so generous. Here's what it looks like. Here's what your generosity is doing around the world. And we're going to continue to do that. Our new construction, because guess what? Since we built this, we've only, we built this five years ago. Isn't that crazy? And since we built this five years ago, construction costs have nearly doubled. That's just the world we live in now. That's the reality. So new construction and renovating this so that we can make sure it works for kids, it's right around $10 million. Okay, big numbers, right? But that brings our whole debt load to about $13 million. Now, I've talked to several people, and I go, man, I don't know. I think we've got to raise half of that to get a shovel in the ground. And I've talked to several people who go, well, why don't we just go for the whole 13? I'm like, I don't think you understand how this works. Uh, that's a lot of money. Like, yeah, but then we'd be debt-free and 100% of what we do could just go to ministry. I go, all right, let's go for it. So my big goal is $13 million. But here's the magic number. When we get to $6 million, we can get a shovel in the ground. When we get to $6 million, we can put a shovel in the ground. Now, if that feels overwhelming, let me tell you, I'm with you. It feels overwhelming to me too. It feels like a lot because it is a lot. That's a lot, but here's what I can tell you. It's not a lot for God. From day one, wherever God has guided, he's always provided. Every time that God has given us vision for the future, he's given us provision for the future. And I know this is a lot of money. I realize this, but this is, this is why it will require 100% participation. 
And I get that we're all at different income levels financially. It's not about equal giving. It's just about equal sacrifice. That all of us praying and doing our best to do what we believe God is asking us to do. To simply go, God, what would you have me do? What have you given me? What, what, how could I participate in this? And then we're just obedient to whatever we feel God is speaking to us. And here's what I need you to hear. I'm not going to do cartwheels for the next three weeks. We're not going to be launching off fireworks and doing high-pressure sales. I'm simply going to present you with the vision, and then I'm going to trust you. That's it. We're going to do a bunch of 10 Q&A meetings over the next two weeks. I'm going to present you with the vision. Uh, in two weeks, we're going to make commitments, and then we'll keep you apprised of the uh, ongoing, uh, you know, where we're at. God's given us the vision. We know exactly what we need to build, and we, we can stay on mission for the one. We know exactly what needs to happen so that we aren't just comfortable in our lifetime, but so that the faith of the next generation can continue to grow. The vision is clear, but the pace at which we move is determined by our collective generosity. We will move as fast as we can. Uh, it may take a year, it may take five years. God gives the vision. Our generosity collectively is what determines the pace. I'm so thrilled that I get to be your pastor. I, I, I kid you not, I wake up all the time and pinch myself. I can't believe I get to do this with my life. And as much as we've seen God move in the last 18 years, we are only getting started. Uh, I, I've never been more excited about the future of Westbridge Church. And you need to know, if you're exploring faith in Jesus, we started this church for you. We have always been, from day one, a church that is for the one, that we'd be willing to risk the 99 on the hills to go and find the one that is lost. That is the heartbeat of God, and we will always commit to that. We want you to experience the same hope that Jesus came to offer. Setting aside his own pride and comfort, he humbled himself, he became human, he died, he was buried, and then he rose again. And that means death is not the end. There is more to this life than this life. And you and I have been invited to be a part of God's family. If you've never said yes to that, I want to invite you. I want to invite you to say yes to the hope that's offered in Jesus. And you can just agree with this simple prayer. God, Please forgive my sins. Forgive me for the times that I've walked away from you. I'm so grateful you never walk away from me. So God, I want to say yes to your invitation. Make me your son. Make me your daughter. And help me to put my trust in you and to follow you as best as I know how from this moment on. I want you to be the leader of my life. And God, I pray for every one of us who are a part of Westbridge Church. God, this is a season that we are excited about. It's a season that, frankly, is a little bit daunting and a little bit scary and a little bit intimidating. But I pray that you would give us clarity of vision. I pray that you would unite us as a church family, that you'd give us the courage to step into this next season and to trust you fully. And that as we collectively work on this together, God bless our efforts. And may the things that we do continue to point people to you and not to us. We thank you. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, real quick. Uh, here's how you sign up for one of those Q&A things. You go onto the app, onto the events, and sign up there. You go into westbridgechurch.com forward slash for the one. For everyone who signs up for one of those Q&As and shows up, we have a gift for you. And then on your way out today, please, one per family, grab one of these, look through it, check it out, all kinds of great pictures and photos and details, and then come back to one of these meetings. Thank you so much for being a part of Westbridge Church. I can't wait to see what the future holds. Anything you're not taking with you, drop in the giving stations. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.